that it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be at Ligonier again here and to have the opportunity of ministering the Word of God. The immediately after lunch service is something of a graveyard scene for many preachers, I'm sure, at the Ligonier Conference, and uh, I don't think I've ever had this slot. Um, so, we want to share the adventure together of being strengthened by the Word of God and by its exposition. Now, our topic for this session, as you know, is the church's message, the message of the gospel, and I want to direct your attention for that purpose to Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, and we're going to read there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll begin to read at verse 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning to read at verse 9. These two chapters of Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, in fact, beginning really in chapter 3 and going on to the sixth chapter, are perhaps the most intimate portrait that the Apostle Paul gives to us of what it means to be engaged in gospel ministry. And whatever kind of ministry we are engaged in, we ought obviously to have at least a working knowledge of the teaching in these chapters. And here, as Paul comes towards a climax of this section, he begins to expound the message that he proclaims from verse 9 of chapter 5. So, whether we are at home or away, that is, whether we are in the body or with the Lord, whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. If we are beside ourselves, if we are out of our mind, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And He died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for Him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard Him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Or more literally, if anyone in Christ, new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to Himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making His appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake He made Him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with Him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For He says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. This passage in 2 Corinthians 5 
is by any stretch of the imagination obviously one of the greatest of the Apostle Paul's utterances about the Christian gospel. Indeed, B. B. Warfield, the great American Princeton theologian, commented on this passage that almost uniquely in all of Paul's writings, the Apostle Paul is here speaking to a Christian congregation as though he were preaching the gospel at the street corner. And it is a very important lesson for us in many ways to learn, indeed fundamental for us to learn as Christian people, that over and over again in our Christian lives, for our Christian service, actually our greatest need is to have the gospel preached to us. And then our greatest need is to understand what that gospel is in order that we may preach it to others. I sometimes think in my whimsical moments if we were to hand out three by five cards to congregations of evangelical churches as the people left the sanctuary or the worship center or the building and asked them to outline the gospel, we would be astonished and perhaps dismayed at the sheer variety of answers that were given to that question, what is the gospel? And here, because the apostle understands that in their Christian lives, the Corinthians in different ways are giving a lie to the gospel. And as they give a lie to the gospel, they are witness to the world of Corinth in which the Christian church was intended to stand as a bright shining beacon. Their witness to the church in Corinth was diminished by their inability in the first place to understand the gospel, and in the second place to illustrate the power of the gospel in their fellowship together. And we are living again in a time rather like the first century in fragmented religion, in the midst of the idolatries of the 21st century that are in so many instances so like the idolatries of the first century, in the midst of New Age religion that is so deeply reminiscent of the Old Age religions of Corinth in the first century, that what Paul has to say to us here seems to come to us with a freshness and a power as he says to the church there, and by the inspiration of the Spirit to the church here, understand what the gospel is. Grasp what Christ has done for you and what Christ has done in you. And as by God's grace you are grasped by this truth, the love of Christ grasps us, says the Apostle Paul we will emerge into the world in which we live as communities, as fellowships, as congregations, as churches, as well as as individuals who are able to make a profound impact for the gospel. So glorious is its message, so powerful its transforming grace, so lively the communities that it creates that the world will understand, as Paul says almost incessantly in this passage, God, the sovereign Lord, has done something unparalleled in the history of the world, and by it He brings grace and salvation to lost and dying sinners. Now, you know from your study of Paul and your study of the Scriptures in general, that when the gospel is preached in the New Testament, it's preached from a series of different angles. There are different pictures employed to help us understand what the gospel is. There is the picture in the word propitiation that belongs to the world of the temple and sacrifices and underlines for us that we cannot approach the presence of God unless a sacrifice, a propitiation is made for our sins. 
And then at times, Paul seems to take us to the world of the slave market and speaks about our need for redemption. We are in slavery and bondage to sin, but Jesus Christ has come into the slave market of the world and has paid our redemption price. Christ is our Redeemer. And then we're taken into the world of the law court and conscious that before the holy judgment of God, we stand as guilty and therefore condemned sinners. And Jesus Christ has borne the penalty for our sin and brings us, by God's grace, free justification through faith. Interestingly, the picture that Paul actually seems to use most comprehensively in his writings. He uses it in Romans, he uses it in 2 Corinthians, he uses it in Ephesians, and he uses it in Colossians, a wider spread than even he uses the narrower concept of justification. Here in 2 Corinthians, Paul uses language that in some ways touches our situation and our hearts in a way that rings even more contemporaneously for us than the language of slavery or of the law court or of the temple court. He uses the language of reconciliation. And the background, of course, is a world of alienation. He is speaking about the way in which the gospel comes into a world of alienation and provides a glorious reconciliation. And I say in a fascinating way that has a very contemporaneous ring about it. In the last hundred years or so, alienation and reconciliation have become major words in the vocabulary of the Western world alienation in family, alienation in marriage, alienation between parents and children, and children and parents, alienation from ourselves. The world of Freud, the world of Marx, is a world that understands that there is a deep-seated alienation in the human condition, whether it be superficially understood as merely the worker's alienation from the fruition of his work, or the more sinister undertones of Freud's understanding of an individual's alienation from himself. This is a society that understands the reality of alienation. You would only need to track the exponential growth of the therapeutic industries and the pharmaceutical aspect of those therapeutical industries to understand that this is a world in deep alienation. And Paul understands this, but he wants to say to this world of deep alienation that the fundamental cause of that alienation is not to be found in my frustration as a worker, nor in my frustration merely with myself. The fundamental problem of humanity, my fundamental problem, the reason why I need reconciliation is to be found first and foremost in my alienation from God. It's very interesting, actually, that this New Testament word for reconciliation basically means to make a change or an exchange. And it's in that sense that Paul actually uses it. As you see the need of the human condition, you understand that mankind's deepest need is for his present relationship to God to be transformed from alienation to reconciliation. And although in this passage, this is not Paul's most fundamental concern, he's already spoken about it 
at the beginning of chapter 4, as well as in many other places in his letters, although it's not his most fundamental concern in this passage. He makes it as clear here how desperately he feels the need for mankind's reconciliation as he does anywhere else in all of his writings. As he speaks, for example, in profoundly emotional language, verse 11, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Verse 14, we are constrained to do this by the love of Christ. Verse 19, he says, God has entrusted to us a message of reconciliation, and therefore, verse 20, we implore you to be reconciled to God. And he gives us some little clues here as to why he feels the enormous burden to appeal, to beseech, to beg men and women and boys and girls to be reconciled to God. It is because, as he understands, he gives us a little hint of this in verse 15 when he suggests that he, as well as others, have lived for themselves. In verse 16, when he suggests that he once, like the rest of mankind, regarded Christ from a human point of view. You know, if you say to your colleagues at work or your neighbor in the street or the person you have your recreation with, do you know, my dear friend, that you are alienated from God? He or she is likely to say, you have misunderstood me. Far from being alienated from God, I think rather highly of God. I have no quarrel with God. And Paul is giving us one of the litmus tests that we can use, which is this. Tell me, my friend, how you view Jesus Christ. And Paul is saying, unless we view Jesus Christ from God's point of view, that is to say, as we have already heard, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess, Jesus Christ is Lord. Unless that is the disposition of my soul towards Jesus, I am at enmity with God. God says, honor me, honor my Son, and not to bow before Him as Lord, not to trust Him as only Savior, is the clearest evidence that I really am alienated from God. And no matter what language is used, no matter what religious behavior patterns are employed, the apostle is saying the man or woman, boy or girl, who views Jesus Christ merely from the horizontal point of view. Yes, I think Jesus was the greatest religious teacher who ever lived. You know as well as I do that that's one of the surest signs that somebody has never carefully read the teaching that Jesus gave, in which He summons men and women to follow Him to the cross, to bow before Him as Lord, to give up, if necessary, home, family, possessions, friends, children, future, for His sake and the gospels. And anything other would be to view Jesus Christ after the flesh, according to this world's standards. And it is, says the Apostle Paul, as though, although I emphasize again, this is not the most overwhelming burden of his life in terms of these verses. He is more interested in the cure for our alienation in this passage. He is prepared to say to us that our deepest need is for reconciliation 
because if we are thus alienated in our disposition towards God in Jesus Christ, God is alienated in His disposition from all those who will not bow to the Lord Jesus Christ as their only Savior and their only Lord. So, he does speak here about our need for the message of the gospel, and it's so clear then why he speaks about it as a message of reconciliation, because we need that basic relationship with God exchanged for a wholly new relationship of reconciliation. And the glory of the gospel for the Apostle Paul, and this is why so many of the verbs in this passage have as their subject God Himself. The glory of the gospel is that God has provided the very reconciliation we need. We stand in need of an exchange, and God in His mercy and grace has provided for us an exchange. You notice His words in verse 19, God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses. Now, you know, when your colleague or neighbor or friend sees that, I think he is likely to say, I wish you would calm down a little. You know, all this passion that you, you've tried to persuade me, I need to be reconciled to God, that I'm alienated from God. But this, is, this God of verse 19, Paul's God of verse 19, that's the kind of God I believe in. I believe in a God who doesn't count men's sins. Isn't that what Paul says? Well, no, it's not what Paul says. What Paul says is that in Christ, God does not count men's sins against them. And in putting it that way, he answers the question, if God doesn't count my sins against me, against whom then does He count my sins? And that's the question he answers in verse 21. God made Him, that is Christ, who knew no sin, to be made sin for us in order that we might become in Him the righteousness of God. And there, you see, He brings us to the very heart of the gospel message. And a child could understand this. We stand in need of an exchange of our relationship of hostility to God for a relationship of friendship and reconciliation with God. And God provides that for us in the exchange that Jesus Christ makes. God made Him to be my sin, and in and through Him He makes me to be Christ's righteousness. And in these words, Paul is really summarizing what is essentially the message of the Bible all the way through, that the saving God would be the God who would bear upon His own shoulders His own judgment against men and women's sins. And it's the picture of the Bible from virtually the very beginning. And right through the course of Old Testament revelation, the picture that's given to us in the topology of the Old Testament, that, that picture book, sacrificial system, perhaps most notably in the day when the sins of the people were confessed over these two goats on the great day of atonement, and one of them with the sins of the people, as it were, upon his head would be taken and slaughtered, and the other would be taken out to wander into the wilderness, bearing the sins of the people upon his head to disappear into the no man's land between heaven and earth a kind of double focus picture of what our Lord Jesus Christ would come to do. 
as God, as it were, confessed over His Son's heads the sins of His people, and the Son was called then to wander into the no-man's land between heaven and earth that would cause Him to cry, My God, why have even you forsaken me? And bear the judgment of God against our sins by His judgment into death upon the cross of Calvary. So that from the very beginning of the new community of God's Israel, they're able to see year after year the mystery of how God Himself would provide a way of reconciling sinners to Himself. It's the same in Bible prophecy, isn't it? I suppose if you know any passage of the Old Testament that looks forward to the coming of Jesus, you know it in Isaiah 53. He was wounded for transgressions that were ours. He was bruised for iniquities that were ours. Upon Him was the chastisement to bring us peace. With His stripes we are made whole. All we like sheep have gone astray and turned every one to his own way, but the Lord has laid upon him the iniquities of us all. And it's the great message of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Son of Man came to give His life a ransom for many. It's the message of the Apostle Paul. He was made to be sin that we might be made to be righteousness. He bore the curse in order that we might experience the blessing. It's the story of Gethsemane and Jesus having given the cup of blessing and salvation into the hands of His disciples, taking from His Father's hands the cup that they ought to have been drinking, and taking their place, and making the exchange. Do you remember when Joseph brought his two sons to his father at the end of his father's life so that they might receive the blessing of their grandfather before he died, and he he pushed his elder son forward to get the blessing of the right hand, and the younger son forward to receive what would come from the left hand, and the grandfather crossed over his hands, and he gave to the older son what should have come to the younger son, and to the younger son what should have come to the older son. He made an exchange. And it's really this, in its essence, that Paul is saying to us, happened on the cross. As God, as it were, crossed over His hands, and His right hand of blessing falls upon penitent sinners, and His left hand of judgment fell upon His own dear Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And on the cross, He bore our sin. He died that we might be forgiven. In my place, condemned, He stood and sealed my pardon with His blood. No wonder we sing, hallelujah, what a Savior. And do you notice as Paul expounds this to us, Paul underlines that this is not only an atoning work that brings sinners salvation and pardon and reconciliation. This is a finished work. This is not something Jesus does for me because I have come to trust Him. This is something Jesus completed for me in order that I might come to trust Him. God, he says, was in Christ 
reconciling the world to Himself. And so, the message of the gospel, says the Apostle Paul, is not put the finishing touches to what Jesus has done, but lay down your arms, lay down your enmity, come to Jesus Christ in faith, and trust in Him, yield to Him, rest on Him, be reconciled, receive the reconciliation that God has accomplished and embodied in Jesus Christ. Do you know, that's a very important principle in Paul's understanding of the gospel, because Paul didn't preach justification or reconciliation or propitiation. Paul really preached Jesus Christ, in whom we find justification in whom we find propitiation, in whom we find reconciliation. We don't come to Jesus in order to take benefits from His hands and then go our own way in the thinking of the Apostle Paul, as though foolishly we think we could come to Him and receive a commodity called salvation and live any way we please. No, says the apostle, God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself. And so, if we are to be reconciled to God, if we are to receive the reconciliation, then it is to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ that we must go. And so, you remember, he said to the Corinthians already, we preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Christ is the center of His message, because it is in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone, he says, that reconciliation with God is to be found. But he's not finished when he said this. There is a dark shadow behind everything he says when he speaks about our need for reconciliation. Since verse 10, after all, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. There is a deep need for an exchange to take place. In Jesus Christ, God has provided right at the heart of the gospel the exchange that we need. But then Paul goes on in these verses, thirdly, to speak not only about the need for the message of the gospel, the heart of the message of the gospel, but the effects of the message of the gospel. And this, too, is part of our message. What is the effect of the message of the gospel? Well, the effect is summarized here in perhaps the most famous verse in this whole passage in chapter 5, verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Or as I said more literally, if anyone in Christ, new creation, Paul doesn't mean, you see, if I become a Christian, I have become a new creature. That's true, but I don't think it's what he's saying here. He is saying, when by faith you get out of yourself and into Jesus Christ in union and communion with all that Jesus Christ is for you, the first thing that will strike you is that a door has been opened into a new order of reality altogether. And in that new order of reality, the old life has been exchanged for the new. And you'll notice how he gives this in a little detail. He says, for example, in this new creation, the old view of myself is exchanged for a new view of myself. I used to live, he says, for myself, verse 15, but now in Christ, I no longer live for myself, but for Him who for my sake died and was raised. It is no longer I 
who live, as he says in Galatians chapter 2, I no longer live to myself, I live to Jesus Christ. That's why he says earlier on in the passage in verse 13, if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. In other words, he is saying, my life has so been turned to Jesus Christ, to live for Jesus Christ, that even if people think I've lost my senses, I'm prepared to endure that for the glory of my God. It's a matter of relative indifference what others may think about me. If only I can live this exchanged life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it goes with something else, he says, not only a new view of self in place of the old, but a new view of others in place of the old. Verse 16, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. I think you know in the life of our churches, this is one of the, the sweetest and most wonderful things to see. A teenager is brought to faith in Christ who had been brought up in a, in a general society of teenagers alienated from their parents and by and large despising their parents. And, and this teenager comes through faith in Jesus Christ no longer to view his or her parents after the flesh, according to the flesh, from this world's perspective, from this teenage world's perspective, but begins to love them and to care for them and to pray for them and to long for them, and even perhaps if they are not Christians yet, to weep for them and to be burdened about them and to seek to serve them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have a dear friend who told me he is a minister in Wales. He told me of an occasion when they were interviewing a young man for possible membership in their fellowship, and the young man had wonderfully really been converted, but he didn't have the vocabulary yet. He, has still, he still had to learn just how this new world really operated. And as he sat before my friend and the group of elders in the church, he said, you know, since, since I started coming to your church, there have been dramatic changes in it. Absolutely, I'm amazed at the changes. He said, when I came, first of all, you used to be singing all the wrong hymns. The tunes were terrible, and the words didn't make sense, and you were reading out of all the difficult passages in the Bible and you were choosing the wrong people to lead in prayer. And, and he pointed at my friend, and he said, and your sermons, they were so long, and they were so dull. He says, I don't know what's happened to you all in the last few months. <laughs> but now, he said, the hymns, you're choosing glorious hymns, and, and there's something about the prayers. And he said to my friend, and your sermons, I don't know what's happened to you, but your sermons are transformed out of all recognition. And these men were experienced enough and wise enough not to jump all over his head, screw his neck, and say, don't you understand what's happened to you, young man? <laughs> but to recognize that by God's grace he had been ushered into the kingdom of light from the kingdom of darkness, and his eyes would soon get used to the light. The glorious transformations that are made when anyone is in Christ. And so, says Paul, we not only find that our new view of self is different from our old, and our new view of others is different from our old, but those things are true because our new view of the Lord Jesus is different from the old. He says, verse 16, in the middle, we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard Him thus no longer. We regard Him thus no longer. Aren't those great words? When the gospel takes 
hold of somebody, and they feel that they have entered into a new creation. Now, you know, one of the interesting things about the language Paul uses here, if anyone is in Christ, indeed, one of the interesting things about the language of the whole of the New Testament is that when the New Testament preaches the gospel to us, it doesn't ordinarily tell us to let Christ in, as though becoming a Christian believer were somehow just a matter of adding what is in Jesus Christ to what is already there in order to make a difference. And this is why down through the centuries, actually, in the preaching of the gospel, the dominant note at the end of sermons was not so much a matter of, won't you let Jesus in, but rather, trust in Him, flee to Him, go to Him, turn to Him, in the recognition that what I need is to get out of myself, as it were, out of the old creation, out of the old alienation, out of the bondage, out of the darkness, and into Jesus Christ, and into the new creation, and into God's marvelous light, and into all the treasures of reconciliation with God in Jesus Christ, and into the world of every spiritual blessing that is poured out upon me in Jesus Christ. And this is how the apostle proclaims the gospel. He tells us, about the need for the gospel and the heart of the gospel and the effects of the gospel. But I still haven't exhausted what he says here, because there's really a fourth thing that he speaks about, and it runs throughout the whole of this section. The need for the gospel, the heart of the gospel, the effects of the gospel. But then he describes the motives of those who spread the gospel. And this is so rich. Let me simply give you the headings of what he says. He begins in verse 9 by telling us what his grand motivation in spreading the gospel is, whether we are at home, in the body, or away from the body, as we walk by faith and not by sight. Verse 9 we make it our aim to please Him. And this isn't an isolated statement of Paul in a, in a moment of high emotion. This is the kind of thing that he writes calmly from prison in Philippians chapter 1, to me to live is Christ. And in chapter 3 of Philippians, all I care for is to know Christ. And he's saying to us that as he spreads the message of the gospel, the thing that dominates his disposition and therefore impacts the way in which he spreads the gospel is that he lives in order to please the Lord Jesus Christ. And as he lives to please the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a, there's a kind of disposition wrought into His very being that becomes almost visible as He, as he gets to know people, and as people get to know Him, they, they may not be able to understand it or interpret it, but they, they keep asking the question, what is there about this man that is so different? We can't categorize Him in our terms, everybody else we know is wanting to please himself or to please others or to please the world or to please his boss, but to please man, and somehow or another, we can't get Paul into that box. And you don't need to be an apostle by any stretch of the imagination for this to be true about you and to be one of the leading instruments in your life that enables you to bring the message of the gospel to others who are inquiring why you are so different from everybody else they may know. 
And the answer is a simple sentence of four words, I want Christ's pleasure. And my friends, it doesn't really matter who you are. That will tell and be one of the means through which the gospel of Jesus Christ is communicated to you. You know, William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, was once asked why he felt his life had made such a powerful impact on 19th century England and beyond. And he said, I think the answer is that there was a day when I said, from now on, for the pleasure of Jesus Christ. Somebody reminded his daughter after he had died that he had said this, and she said, you know, that wasn't quite the real secret of my father's life. The real secret of my father's life is that he said from now on for the pleasure of Jesus Christ, and it was so. Paul makes it his aim in life to please Christ even if it means that people, verse 13, think he is beside himself. I know a man who wrote a wonderful book on the history of the church in Cambodia, and he recalls in that book, Killing Fields, Living Fields, the story of a man who was in a prisoner of war camp, essentially, who was regarded literally as out of his mind, who used to do strange things in the camp, and because he did strange things, he would wander around with his hands in the air, hands flying. They gave him strange things to do. He was the one who took the human excrement out. And what the guards didn't know was that in the darkness at night, he would get his little New Testament out from beneath his pillow, and he would teach his fellow prisoners the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he was actually a university academic, thought to be out of his mind, and willing to appear to be out of his mind in order that he might find ways of pleasing Jesus Christ. You know, one of the reasons Paul was so fruitful, and our churches are so fruitless, and my dear friends, they are in some respects. There are not multitudes, indeed not many people, being converted in many churches. Why should that be the case? Ah, the sovereignty of God. Ah, yes, but God ordinarily uses instruments that are at His disposal and live entirely for His pleasure. God delights to use instruments that are absolutely in harmony with Him. Are you really living for the pleasure of Jesus Christ? That's one of the first qualifications for being a useful instrument of the message of the gospel. And so, says Paul, we not only live for the pleasure of Jesus Christ, but we understand that part of our task in life is to persuade others of Christ. Verse 11, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. And you notice that the logic there backs up into verse 10. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Robert Murray McChain wrote in his diary on one occasion, as I came in today, I was walking in the fields, and the thought came to me with almost overwhelming power that everyone to whom I speak must shortly stand before the judgment seat of Christ and be sent either to heaven or to hell. Do you really believe that? And yet you remain silent? Why should that be? Do you notice what Paul says here? This is so helpful, it seems to me. We, that's you Corinthians, 
myself, the apostle, those who are with me, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due. And so, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Does that mean that Paul engaged in evangelism out of a terrible fear of judgment? No, it almost seems to have been the very reverse in Paul's case. When he looks to the day of judgment, he's looking to a day when his justification is going to be crowned, when he's going to receive the prize. He runs towards the day of judgment. What's the difference between Paul's view of the day of his judgment and the day of judgment in the view of so many Christians? Do you remember that parable Jesus told, the parable of the minas in Luke chapter 19, when the king, the master, the Lord who is traveling gives various amounts of money to his servants to look after, and he comes back and he discovers that they have used their talents in different ways. And then it's so interesting that the one who has abused it is the one who said, I knew you were a hard man. I knew you were a harsh judge, and so I did nothing. But the others who understood something of the grace and graciousness of the Master who had profited. Here was one who came and said, I've made, I've made a five-fold profit, Master. What turns out to be a couple of years' wages? And the Master says, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm going to put you in charge of five cities. Now, do you understand what Jesus is teaching there? He's teaching that there is some kind of relationship between service in His kingdom and His glorious reward in the future. But the only connection seems to be the number. There's no proportion between multiplying a little money five times and being made the mayor of five cities. And that's the very point of the story, that the judgment of the Master is a judgment that is out of all proportion to our service. It is a judgment according to the lavish grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. My dear friends, when we stand him before Him at the judgment seat, and He says to us, let me momentarily review your life. Is it not true that through this means, this person, yes, with others, was brought to faith in Christ, that through your prayers. I want you to see how I used your prayers. I want you to see how you were a link in a chain whose end you never saw that brought somebody to faith in Jesus Christ. You do know, don't you, that almost every famous Christian whose name you know, you don't know the name of the person through whom they were converted the links in the chain. And if he says, well, he says, I've just pointed out six or seven ways in which I used you. In the new heavens and the new earth, I'm going to make you mayor. Or if it were in Scotland, Lord Provost of six or seven different cities. Orlando. You can have Orlando. Disney World and all. You can have somewhere in Southern California. You can have a lovely city in Italy. You can have Edinburgh if you want. And you say to him, Lord Jesus, what on earth did I ever do to deserve this? And he will say to you, don't you understand yet my grace? And I will say to him, Lord Jesus, if I'd known you were this gracious, I would have wanted to tell so many more people than I ever did how gracious you are as a saving friend. I wonder if it's true that that's the problem for many of us, that we don't bring the message of grace 
because we scarcely believe the grace of the message. Paul is teaching us that it's the love of Christ, verse 14, that constrains us to go to the world. Dear brothers and sisters, this is a glorious gospel message. May God give us grace to bring it to a dying world. Let us pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for the riches of Your grace that You have lavished upon us in Jesus Christ. Help us for ourselves so to taste them, so to understand them, so to rejoice in them that through our lifestyle, in our fellowship, by our words, as Your church, we may bring to a dying world the message of our reconciling Savior. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen.